On Thursday, May 23rd, 2019, SpaceX launched one of its most important payloads in the history of the company. 60 satellites that will begin the constellation of their Starlink internet satellite system. There were several delays leading up to the launch. It was originally supposed to launch on May 15th, but the high upper level winds scrubbed it. Then the launch was pushed back a week because they needed to upgrade the software on all 60 satellites. But finally, on Thursday, the rocket lifted off from Cape Canaveral at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time from the Space Launch Complex 40 pad. This launch was the heaviest payload SpaceX has ever put into a Falcon rocket. 18.5 tons, not even a Falcon Heavy has flown this much mass. Furthermore, the launch was made on a booster that has already flown to space two times. This is a thrice flown rocket. After this mission, the booster landed safely at sea on its floating barge. So maybe it'll get to be used many more times to launch many more of these satellites. At the very end of their live broadcast, SpaceX showed the rack of Starlink satellites drifting away from the upper stage. The inertia of their rotating rack was enough for the satellites to drift away from each other and deploy. And then, a few hours later, Elon Musk announced to Twitter that all 60 satellites were online and were about to deploy their solar arrays. SpaceX announced on Friday, May 24th, that this would be the first of six Starlink launches for the year, with even more coming in 2020 to bring a total of 720 satellites in orbit. This wasn't the first Starlink launch, however. They put two test satellites into space in 2018, 1010A and B, and they used them to demonstrate how they would work well at the lower altitude and use that to get approval from the Federal Communications Commission, which oversees broadcast satellites. According to the Starlink website, they'll be offering service to the northern U.S. and Canada after the completion of the first six launches. They'll have coverage for the entire planet at the end of 24 launches, at a pace of two to six Starlink launches a year. Each satellite weighs in at 227 kilograms, is less than a meter across, and they stack together like a set of folding chairs so that they can fit perfectly inside a Falcon 9 launch fairing. Each satellite has four phased array antennas, which will allow them to broadcast an enormous amount of data that can be transmitted over a relatively small region below the satellite. Because they fly so low, they can transmit as much data at a lower cost. The satellites use a single solar array, which folds out when the spacecraft has been deployed. Of course, I wonder if they know a company that builds solar panels. And each satellite is equipped with an ion engine. Now, we've done a whole video about ion engines if you want to understand how they work. The key here is that they're powered by krypton and not xenon gas, which will allow them to maneuver themselves into new positions, raise their orbit to battle the constant atmospheric drag, and deorbit themselves at the end of their missions. Krypton is cheaper and easier to acquire than Xenon, and NASA has actually done its own series of tests with this propellant. The satellites use a star tracker on board to calculate their current altitude so that they can reposition themselves to maximize ground coverage. The entire Starlink constellation will fly at an altitude of 550 kilometers, a little higher than the International Space Station that flies at about 400 kilometers, but almost half the height of the Iridium satellite network that flies at almost 800 kilometers. GPS satellites, on the other hand, fly at an altitude of over 20,000 kilometers, and television broadcast satellites fly at nearly 36,000 kilometers. These first 60 satellites will actually have a few less features than the final versions. They won't be able to communicate with each other. Instead, they'll need to communicate with the ground. The phased array transmitters act like a group of small antennae which work together to target their signal in a very specific direction. You'll need a pizza box sized receiver which needs to have a clear view of the sky so that you won't be able to connect with your cell phone yet, but you'd be able to put it in your car, boat, and in your cottage. 
We don't know how much it's going to cost, but the financial industry would love to get their hands on a service provider that transmits at the true speed of light, which is much faster than fiber optic cable. SpaceX says it wants to be able to provide internet to underserved regions of the world, which means, I hope, it'll be affordable for everyone. We don't know how fast it'll be, but SpaceX has said gigabit speeds with very low ping times. Elon Musk also noted that they'll be in a peer-to-peer -peer configuration. This means that your signals will be encrypted on your receiver, transmitted to the satellites, and then it'll be retransmitted by all of them. Your receiver will then decrypt any data meant for you and reject everything else. And if this is true, it'll be a restoration of net neutrality, since there'll be no intermediary looking at your data. Countries won't be able to block the data coming into their borders, although they'll be able to restrict the sales of the receivers. I'm sure you're wondering about space junk, 12,000 satellites in low Earth orbit. That sounds dangerous. And we'll talk about that in a second, but first I'd like to thank Zeraldo Lagrange, Robert Keller, Adam Lander, Analog Sky, and the rest of our 808 patrons for their generous support. They contribute so that you can see these videos and we can make them freely available to anyone who wants to learn about space. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today and get in on the action. All right, let's talk about space junk. Maybe not with 60, but once you get to 4,000 or even 12,000 satellites operating in this constellation, it sounds like a big problem, but it's actually not that big of a concern. That's because the satellites will be operating at such a low altitude. They're experiencing constant drag from the Earth's atmosphere, in the same way that the International Space Station needs to be constantly boosted to maintain its altitude. The Starlink satellites will need to use their thrusters to maintain altitude. If their thrusters break down, they'll naturally decay and burn up within 1.5 years. Debris from collisions that do happen will get deorbited quickly as well. We don't need to worry about Starlink because of its low altitude. We need to worry about the satellites, which are much higher, where there's so little air resistance that they might take hundreds or thousands of years to come back to Earth. To speed up the process, the Starlink satellites will be able to use their thrusters as they're approaching the end of life to burn up in the atmosphere. Ideally, Starlink will be able to tell us when and where these are going to happen so that we can watch the show as they re-enter the atmosphere like a really bright meteor. Finally, the Starlink satellites will have the Department of Defense's debris tracking database on board to shift orbits autonomously and avoid debris and other spacecraft. But here is the really bad news. This amazing video was captured by Marco Langroke from the Netherlands. It's a train of recently launched Starlink satellites moving together, slowly drifting apart. And many other people in the region thought they were seeing UFOs, which means they're gonna be this easy to see with the unaided eye. When the full constellation is launched, there'll be dozens of satellites in the sky at all times. Most of them will be in shadow, but you'll always be able to see some zipping like stars across the sky down near the horizon after sunset. And for the higher latitudes, some will be visible for complete passes. Astronomers won't be happy. Photographs and astronomical data will contain satellite passes and will need to be fixed. If Starlink was willing to donate a few in space telescope mode, I'm sure it would smooth things over. But the night sky is never going to look the same again. There'll be a constant reminder of a satellite constellation just overhead. Of course, this is just the first globe-spanning internet satellite constellation in the works. Amazon announced that they're working on their own version, which makes sense since Jeff Bezos owns a rocket company too, but there are at least a half dozen other companies rolling out their own constellations. Not only will we get global high-speed satellite internet, but we're going to get lots of competition, which is always a good thing for consumers, but a more crowded night sky. Like I said, it was an important launch. Within a couple of years, you could go anywhere on Earth and have a high-speed internet connection so that you can watch, I don't know, my videos or, you know, do whatever you want. If I was an existing internet service provider, I would be freaking out. It is not like they spent the last decade building a lot of loyalty with their customers and they're ripe for disruption. 
Humanity spends more than a trillion dollars a year on worldwide telecommunication services, and you could fund a lot of missions to Mars with that kind of money. This is going to change everything. What do you think? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Once a week, I gather up all my space news into a single email newsletter and send it out. It's got pictures, brief highlights about the story, and links so that you can find out more. Go to universetoday.com newsletter to sign up. And did you know that all of my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format? So you can have the latest episodes show up right on your audio device. Go to universetoday.com audio or search for Universe Today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'll put a link in the show notes. And finally, here's a playlist.